Hello, welcome today. My name is Sarah Lewis. I started this venture, All Moms Need Help, as a way to help mommies and parents everywhere as our lives have been upended during this unexpected coronavirus. It's changed our personal and professional lives and left us with many questions and concerns. Uh, every, every time I do a video, I focus on a topic that is really needed. And today I've got a really special one for you. Um, I've been following chat rooms. I've been following Facebook groups. I've talked to a lot of moms personally, and I've heard their stories about their frustrations of being at home, homeschooling um, accidentally overnight, uh, working on a curriculum that they themselves did not create, and uh, many times having to work full time uh, from home. Uh, for lack of a better word, a lot of moms are at the end of their rope. Um, on top of that, we most of us have heard that school's going to be closed for the calendar year. And some states have even hinted that they will not come back in the fall. So here we are, accidental homeschoolers, uh, trying to figure out our way um, and do our best for our children. Um, and certainly, um, you know, not ignoring that there are children that have special needs um, that are dealing at home. Uh, parents are dealing with uh, speech language pathology issues, ADHD. Um, there are some children that, but for the school providing food, they may not even eat, um, which is hard to imagine. Um, so we all have a lot of questions and worries right now, and I know we're all trying to help each other. But I do want you to know that you are making a difference in your child's life, whether you realize it, whether you feel it or not, you are making a positive difference and you can do this. Uh, it may surprise some of you to find out that less than 30 years ago, what moms and parents are doing right now uh, during this pandemic would have been illegal. In fact, homeschooling did not become legal in all 50 US states until 1993. And according to the Homeschool Legal Defense, uh, most edu homeschool education was illegal even early on in the 1980s. So I share this as a way, hopefully, to encourage you so you know that what you're doing today that may feel frustrating and, and overwhelming, people fought for, fought hard to have this option and opportunity. In fact, today my special guest is Zan Tyler. And she's experienced this firsthand when she went to, she wanted to homeschool her youngest son at the time. Um, and she was headed to jail for it, possibly headed to jail. Um, and Zan Tyler is a nationally known author and speaker. And she's here today to share her story with us and um, homeschool journey. And we, we can do this. So um, Welcome, Zan. Thank you so much for coming today. I know you are extremely busy and have a lot going on, so we're, we're thrilled to hear from you. Well, it is my pleasure to be here with you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, so first, you're a mom, obviously. Um, tell us about your family. How many children do you have, that sort of thing? Well, I have three grown kids who are all married, uh, and all of them, I've got six grandchildren and one on the way out on the west coast in Pasadena. So these are exciting times. Uh, we homeschooled them all kindergarten through high school. They all went on to college. Um, John, uh, my middle son is an attorney. Uh, Ty, my oldest son was in medical device sales and is now in a different area of sales. And my daughter is a, an, a, a senior producer with a major network on the west coast. So we are, we are, some of us are together and we're spread out, but we still love each other and uh, interact a great deal in each other's lives. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I, I meant to mention this earlier, but um, you know, my, my next question was going to be, of course, tell us your story. How did you get into homeschooling? Um, initially, you were not exactly for the homeschool route, that's not what Oh, you're... goodness, no. As a matter of fact, when I was in college, I used to say there were two things I would never do. One was teach and the other was have kids. 
So I, I really, you know, I was on my way to law school. I went to Furman University, um, wanted to go to law school, and I was really very career focused. And so my life took an interesting turn when I, I did get married right after college and had children uh, within a year. And so it, it, it's been, it's been not a boring journey. Uh, so I was a stay-at-home mom, um, never intended to be a mom, especially not a stay-at-home mom, but I was a stay-at-home mom with my children, my two boys. They were uh, seven and nine when Lizzie was born. So, uh, so we were, they went to preschool and kindergarten and they were just headed to life in public school, maybe a Christian school that our church was starting uh, until a friend of mine mentioned homeschooling to me. Uh, she and her husband were actually getting their master's degrees and were on their way to Kenya as missionaries. Susan had her master's in education and had taught. And she said, Zan, when Matt gets, when Nat gets old enough, I'm going to homeschool him. And the first time, this is 1984, the first time I heard that word homeschool, I felt like that scene in Star Wars where they're in the trash compactor and the walls start closing in because everybody in my family is an extrovert. And the worst thing in the world I could imagine was homeschooling. And besides that, normal people did not homeschool in 1984. And she gave me a book to read by Dr. Raymond Moore, Homegrown Kids. And it really just created this desire in me to do something different for my children. And I, I can't explain it. It was vision casting. It was different, but I was really called to that. Um, but in the end, I decided it was too much for 1984. Um, we didn't know anybody in the world who homeschooled. There were no support groups, no internet. You couldn't even, and we had to hire an attorney just to find out what the law was. And uh, so we, um, I ended up just arranging with the school district to hold my oldest son back a year. And they, at the last minute, reneged on that, which is what launched us into the whole process of homeschooling because at this time private schools were filled. Um, when we did that, I was turned down by our local school district and then I was threatened with jail by the state superintendent of education. So it was, it was quite the journey. Yes, I'm, I'm sure. And, and you're here to speak about it today, which I'm, I'm so glad. <laughs> um, I appreciate what you went through. Um, so, you know, my next, my next question or thought on that is that um, as far as the word homeschooling, that can be kind of a deceiving word. Um, it's not exactly kind of what moms are going through right, right now. Uh, you know, mom, parents, moms are forced by the government to stay mm -hmm. home and provide a curriculum that, uh, and maybe even virtual uh, programs, which is great. Um, can you actually describe in reality, because right now we're kind of in the bubble of COVID-19 and we think this is what homeschooling means and this is what it looks like. Can you actually describe what homeschooling actually is um, and what a parent would typically, uh, you know, what would a parent typically do or how would they go about actually setting up homeschooling? Truly? Sure. Let me say this first though. I tell my story not to create a, whoa, that's terrible or anything else reaction, except to say most people who find their way to homeschooling get into it kicking and screaming a little bit. So there are not many moms who have been on this homeschooling journey who really, who cannot identify with coronavirus moms who are thrown into the situation they never expected to be. So I just want to say to those moms, we'll talk about that in a minute, take a deep breath, relax, create some space to enjoy your kids, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about homeschooling, um, normal homeschooling, if there is such a thing. Um, so I, I would just tell you that there are as many different ways to homeschool as there are families on the planet because every parent is different, every child is different. Some families have 10 kids, some families have one child, some fam families have multiple special needs kids, some, um, some people have kids who are starting their AA degree in the ninth grade and graduate with a college and high school diploma at the same time. It just, as far as homeschooling goes, it runs the gamut 
just like every family has a personality, every homeschool has a personality. So the first thing I would like to, to say to moms out there is there is no right way or wrong way to homeschool. I think the thing you want to do is, and, and I, I mean, certainly when we started, there was no mold. We couldn't look at kids who had graduated from high school and gone on to college and law school and all these other things. There just were none that we knew of. And so what I want to encourage you to do is just, like I said earlier, make space to enjoy your kids during this time. The, the thing I like to tell moms is start with your children and let your scope and sequence flow from that. Because every child, even though we might have standards for each grade, every child is different the way they embrace it. Every child has a unique learning style. And so the way we present the material, how fast we present the material, all of those things are gonna vary based on the needs of the child. And so I don't want that to become overwhelming. Probably the best thing I can say is something I was taught when I was actually at a technology summit in 1995, hosted by the State Department of Education. Barbara Nielsen was superintendent and had it invited all of the uh, local school superintendents in South Carolina. And she asked me to come as a representative of the homeschooling community. Uh, so it was hilarious because in the, you know, between the breakout sessions, all these superintendents were saying, do you think we'll ever use the internet in education? And some were saying, do you know what the internet is? Do you know how to get on the internet? So I tell you that because in 1995, if you had told all of those smart professional educators and superintendents that everybody would be homeschooling or schooling using the internet, we may have all just had heart attacks and fallen out right there. Um, but one of the breakout sessions was by a professor from Stetson, uh, a Dr. Rosen. They were trying to create uh, just a unique innovative district uh, combining Stetson, Disney World and the Osceola School District right outside of Orlando. And their premise was that parents and children need to be connected. And so all of the houses in this newly built neighborhood would have internet so that families could interact and schools needed to be intimate so they would be smaller. And then he started talking about some, some pedagogy. And he said, every day we need to ask three questions about every child. Where is she at? Where is she going? And how are we gonna get her there? Or where is he at? Where is he going? And how are we going to get him there? And he said, and, and really that's what makes homeschooling work is every day, George Bernard uh, Shaw, the British play, play, uh, playwright said, my tailor is the smartest man on the earth because every time he sees me, he takes new measurements and everybody else just assumes I'm the same as they saw me last time. So that's how we are with our children. Every day we can take a deep breath. And, and I would encourage you, especially if you know you're not gonna homeschool after this, you know, you might get the bug, you might get bitten by the bug like I did, totally unexpectedly. But if you don't, make this time count. So I know you've got lesson plans to do. Some of you are working. I know it's hectic, but make yourself take time to know and understand your children at a different level. Ask those questions. Um, don't be afraid to become their greatest students and their greatest cheerleaders. What are their learning styles? What are they interested in? What are they struggling with at school? What are they excelling in? What is the passion that motivates them? And you can have some really meaningful conversations. If you can get outside and walk, talk to your kids while you're walking or while you're playing games or doing laundry. Just, just try to have a different level of conversation with them as you observe them as people. You don't have to be up at a certain time. You don't have to go to bed at a certain time. So enjoy that time together, even if it means curtailing lessons a little bit. You know, there are schools going to be a hodgepodge when you all get back together again, when we all get back together again in September or whenever it is. So take this unique point in history, this point in time to, to really know and converse with your children. 
Thank you for sharing that because I know I've heard from parents that it's, I mean, some actually have eight hours worth of lessons, which is hard to imagine who could sit for eight hours, but, um, and, and they're letting that guide them and yes. there's, right. there's no way it's not possible to really get in and, and recognize maybe there's something that now that we have them home, um, when a video I did before was on ADHD, now you have them in front of you, you can recognize, oh, you know, I, I, this is a little different than last time. And I think there may be something going on here. Maybe there's not something going on, but you know, really more focusing on the child, letting the child, you know, r run the direction versus feeling like, okay, I got to get through this. I got to get through this. I got to get through this. And, and you've got eight hours. That's your, your life. That's exactly right. And Helpful. the beauty, the power of homeschooling, just one, I think of the power sources is that one-on-one -on -one tutoring is so amazingly effective. So if your child is doing a video lesson and has five pages of math problems, find out what he knows and what he doesn't know or where she's struggling and where she, you can let her go. You don't have to do all those problems. You don't have to master every lesson. Talk with them about what they're learning. Make sure you pay attention to the curriculum they're getting. You may love it and embrace it, and then you might be offended by some of it. So you, this is your chance to really peer into what your children are learning in the classroom. Don't be afraid to get in there and interact with that material. No, that's a great point. Um, definitely, you want to know what they're they're learning and and feel like I, I'm going to ask some questions here when yeah. school's back in. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm going to. I think we could talk all day. Honestly, this is just so fascinating to me. Um, so there are. Um, well, I'll say this as far as homeschooling as well, too, just kind of keeping with the topic a little bit, but what you're sharing is very helpful tips. Um, and I know moms will be blessed by that. Um, there are a lot of perceptions about homeschooled children. You know, there's a lot of, um, and children that are not homeschooled for that matter. But that being said, um, one thing that I found really interesting is that a lot of research has shown that children that are homeschooled, um, their GPAs tend to be um, higher in reading and math skills and other subjects than their non-homeschooled peers. Um, and so, I, you know, I thought that that was really encouraging and very, you know, at least while your children are home, like you said, if you don't, if you, if you get the bug and you're interested in learning more about homeschooling, then we can help you with that. If you decide, no, this just isn't going to work, you know, economically, we can't afford it or whatever. There's a variety of reasons why it doesn't work for someone. Um, at least, you know, there, you, it's good to know okay, what I'm doing right now can make a difference because yeah. there's still, even in the short term that I have them here at home with me, there, there are some outcomes that I can actually, I can change and I can control. Absolutely. Um, here are some statistics just for you to mull over. Um, mom, if you're home and you're wondering if homeschooling really works, there's a website I can recommend you to. It's neri.org, N-H-E-R-I.org. It stands for the National Home Education Research Institute uh, by Dr. Brian Ray, who is probably the foremost researcher of homeschooling in the United States. One of the things I've realized as I've read through all the statistical data, uh, and I know Brian personally, and we've had many conversations, is that basically homeschoolers score in the 76th percentile and above on nationally norm standardized tests. By definition, a public school students, the average performance is 50% and um, the way the tests are normed. And so really the homeschooling community has moved the bell curve over a quartile, which is really uh, st statistically impressive and important. Um, the other thing I would say on the other end of things, okay, so what good is homeschooling if it doesn't work? academically. So counterintuitively, we think homeschool kids are going to get out of being homeschooled. They're going to be tied to their mother's apron strings and not be independent in their learning and not be leaders on campus. But as I have talked in, uh, to college admissions counselors all over the country and read books and reports and anecdotal data, I have learned that college admissions counselors love homeschoolers. One college admission counselor from Stanford said, you would think 
that these children would be lost when they come to school, but they have a, a college, but they have an intellectual vitality that our other students don't have because they're not burnt out by having been confined to a classroom for 12 years. They're not academically spent. They have a real zest and love for learning. And the second thing he said is, or that another um, admissions counselor said is, these kids come to the class, the college classroom ready to take charge and ownership of their own education because their mother has taught them how to work through a syllabus and not have their hand held because these moms can't hold the hands of all these um, high school students that they're educating. And he said, while they may think that makes for a less education, they're sending us college kids who know how to sit in a class, do the work without having to have their hand held by a teacher. And the third thing that we have found is that homeschoolers um, exhibit a great amount of leadership on the college campus. And we'll talk about this as we discuss socialization in a minute, very counterintuitive, but very true that they come to their peers ready to take leadership positions. That, that's really helpful because I know people have questions about college and, and that's a great segue to my next question is, of course, I keeping in mind currently, and we don't know for how long we're in the, the COVID-19 bubble of not being able to get out, but, um, you know, questions that people have do, do um, or perceptions, I guess, do homeschool children even have socialization options? Are they, they stuck at home and that's, that's kind of it. Well, now. You know, the first thing I want to say is my husband was laughing because um, people will say, well, this is no different for homeschoolers, but really, as homeschool parents, you view the world as your classroom. And I, I don't know of one homeschool mom who signed up to do homeschooling strictly at home. I mean, there are field trips and there's their support groups and their co-ops and their classes and there's 4-H and there's church groups. You know, these kids are not growing up in a vacuum, but they do receive a large part of their socialization from their parents. So my question is, are we aware of the fact that there's negative socialization and positive socialization? When we look at um, crime or, I mean, all the indicators of kids who aren't doing well, um, I would say the great proportion of homeschooling kids are doing well socially. They embrace their parents' morals. Uh, they embrace their parents' religious beliefs. So these kids are doing quite well for themselves socially. You know, then there are just the things like 4-H clubs and, and speech and debate clubs. And our, our organization, SCAES, has a student council where the kids do a lot of service projects. And so I would say, you know, now for homeschooling, the choice is, the, the question is not, is there socialization available? It's how do I say, how do I know what to say yes to and how do I know what to say no to? Um, because the choices are so great now that the homeschooling community has gotten so large. That's a great, that's a great point. I've noticed that even with, you know, I have a three-year-old and our local zoo has homeschooling programs. I mean, and it's, I think the museum does and um, like if you want to give them music lessons, soccer classes, whatever, there seems to be an abundance of options, even for a three-year-old. Yeah, that's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> you know, which is great. I'm like, great, let's, you know, let's get them started. But, um, you do have to pick and choose uh, for sure, especially if you're multiple. So I was going to ask you the question about have you ever seen or experienced homeschool children be successful um, in the world, but you mentioned your three children in the beginning. So I think we've uh, tied that up pretty <laughs> pretty well. And I know there's, you're not just your three children that are successful as a lot. Right, right. That's just my, my own little lab, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> your lab has been very successful. Um, okay, so uh, have you seen or experienced children that began, uh, you know, in traditional public schooling, traditional schooling, and then transition to the homeschool, um, and then been successful from there, so. Well, I think, I mean, it's amazing. There's so many kids now who ask their parents to homeschool them, um, either for bullying reasons, cyberbullying or bullies at school, or they're just bored or, you know, just whatever. But um, 
but okay, I'm sorry, Sarah. I just lost my train of tra track of train, as my sister used to say. <laughs> No, I mean, that's, that's a great point because I have heard about children that say, please bring me home. I don't, I don't want to be in the school anymore because I yes. don't want to pay for whatever. And that's a sad circumstance, but it's real. It's very yes, real. It is, it's real. And also, uh, I, this is one of my favorite stories. Mike Ferris was the president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association. And in the early days, of course, a lot of parents were faced with hostile superintendents. And there was one woman who wanted to homeschool her special needs child. And the superintendent uh, said, uh, said to this mom, you can't homeschool her. You can't homeschool Maggie. She's special needs. You don't have the qualifications. Well, HSLDA put pressure on the superintendent and they were able to homeschool her. Well, at the end of the year, Maggie's test scores are so high. Now the district labels her as talented and gifted. And the superintendent says, you can't homeschool Maggie. She's gifted and talented. She knows she, she's way, that's way out of the scope of what you know how to do as a homeschool mom. And Mike, you know, loved the irony of the whole situation. He put pressure on the school district again and she was able to homeschool. But I would say that is more the rule rather than the exception. Kids flourish when the education is one-on-one. -on -one. They flourish when they're in a loving home where, you know, education is just part of the warp and woof of life. And, uh, and it, I like to say it's where living and learning intersect. Yeah, that's a great, that's a, that's a beautiful way to put that um, because they are living, whether when they're at school, when they're not, I mean, they're still living and they're definitely yeah. picking yeah. up on things, good and That's bad, wrong. they're learning. Um, so I think we kind of hit this question I had about, you know, do homeschooled children have options like sports and music and dance? So I think we all kind of know the answer to that question. And of course, that depends on where everybody lives. I mean, it's incumbent upon the parent where you live to uh, find the, the resources um, that are available to you. Um, but I would imagine across the, the country, United States, um, where we are, that there are multiple, you know, resources out there now for homeschooled um, parents and, that are looking for And, you know, I would say just along those lines, that especially as your children get older, homeschooling is such a powerful vehicle for allowing them to really pursue their interests. Like my oldest daughter, I mean, my only daughter was uh, very interested in broadcast journalism. So she did an internship with uh, WMHK when they had their, you know, there was an award-winning Christian radio uh, station. And so she was the news director's intern for a year. And, and the things we were able to do with her really supported her interest in that. Uh, the boys were both very interested in sports and politics. And, you know, they were able to participate. Now homeschool kids can participate in uh, public school sports, but then they had the travel soccer leagues and those types of things. And, they can really pull away and focus in on their strengths. Both of the boys were um, uh, Senate pages, legislative aides for Warren Gazay, who was our senator. It was the first time they had hired uh, high school students in that capacity, as I, if I'm correct about that. And then they went on to be part of the United States page program, where they actually went to DC and lived for six to eight weeks and did their schoolwork there and worked in the Capitol and for one of our U.S. Senators. So and there's, you know, there are missions trips and all kinds of ways for your child, if he's interested in mastering Spanish, to do that, to travel, to study, to focus in on that. It, it's just as kids become older, it's a great way for them to learn. My daughter was also very interested in the performing arts. So rather than sending her to governor's school, I'm not saying everybody should do this. We were able to put together a host of people in music and choir and dance and uh, community theater and drama that shared our same belief system where she was really encouraged and nurtured in her talent and in her faith. And so I, I, would I would just say, yeah, I would say that would almost be like a natural transition for a child too, you know, just to yeah. be able to, to feel comfortable with what they're spending their time with. 
Um, yes. and probably that works hand in hand when they're, they're doing their curriculum and then they're doing the extracurricular activities that go hand in hand. It, it just feels like a natural, smooth process, probably. Yes. Yes. It's very, I would say there's a lot of homeschooling that is very seamless where lessons roll into life, roll into service, roll into conversations about what's going on in the world. And it's, it's not a, a bell rings and you have to quit doing this and another bell rings and you have to quit doing this. If you're locked into a, a book or a poem you're writing or a music lesson you're practicing for, you can schedule that time however is flowing with where the student is. So I guess um, there's a lot, you know, a lot that we talked about today, and I'm sure there's a lot more that we could, we could go on all day, probably. So there's just so much to, to discuss with this subject. Um, but I guess, you know, thinking now, um, especially in light of what moms are going through, parents are going through right now, is there anything else you would want to share um, with moms? Um, and in fact, if you want to, you know, tell us about your organization too, and how they can get additional resources. Uh, okay. Yes, I would love to do that. So I have to apologize to your viewers and your listeners. I was telling Sarah last night, I got hit with one of the worst migraines I have had in years. So I had to take some um, pretty daunting medication last night and I've, I've got a little bit of brain fog. So y'all forgive me as I just real quick look up the, um, I want to make sure I get the website right. And as I lose my place sometimes in my conversation. So SCAIS, the South South Carolina Association of Independent Home Schools, S-C-A-I-H-S, is an organization that Joe and I started back in 1990 to offer support and encouragement to homeschooling families. You can actually go through SCAES if you want to homeschool and it meets the legal requirements in South Carolina. Plus we have educational um, counselors in elementary school, middle school, high school, and for special needs. Uh, we've, we've worked to gain the right for all homeschoolers in the state to be eligible for the Palmetto Fellows and the Life Scholarship. So as an organization, we've been very proactive. This is actually our 30th anniversary year for the last 30 years in serving homeschoolers. So for more information, you can go to scays.org or easier is South Carolina is schomeschooling.com. And uh, if you want more info, you can uh, email info at scaes.org, info at scaihs.org, and uh, you can find the phone number on the website. And actually, usually there's an annual membership fee, depending on the size of the family and whether you've got a high school student or a special needs student. But for this one period of time, for those people who feel like they just need educational counseling, uh, we are actually, um, you can call in and get counseling from one of our counselors and they have all been involved in homeschooling in some capacity for many, many years. Uh, and, and it's uh, just for an hourly fee rather than having to join the organization from now to the end of the school year. If you need help where you are, whether it's with a special needs child or what about graduation or how can I teach this subject or are there any recommend, uh, recommendations you have, then you can, um, you can call this case office or look them up and email them and they'll be happy to help. Well, that's very helpful, and I'm going to add all of that information to, um, yeah, I always put the information on the allmomsneedhelp.com website, and I share it on Facebook, too, so I'll be, I'll be sure to share that information, um, and uh, is there, is there, I guess, any, any parting words you can, you would want to share with moms right now while they're in the, in the thick of it, just trying to, feeling like they're burning the candles at both in, overwhelmed, you know, telling themselves, I can't do this. This is it. So, you know, again, I would just say as contradictory as it sounds, take some time off from the schedule. I'm not talking about weeks. I'm talking about a day or an afternoon when you need it and enjoy being together. You may never have this much time with your children again. So you rule the schedule. Don't let the schedule rule you. Um, you can make up lost time quickly in homeschooling when it's one-on-one. -on -one. And I would just, just don't let this opportunity pass you by with your children. Um, 
if if you're interested in homeschooling for next year there's SCAES, there are other homeschooling organizations in south carolina if you're nationwide you can go to hslda.org and find all about the state organizations in your area that's homeschool legal defense association.org and uh, for those in state or out of state there are all kinds of co-ops developed around different ideas joe and i started a co-op years ago which is now excelsior academy in columbia south carolina and uh, they have yes your kids can go to a prom they have a beautiful formal every year for their their senior students is what just made me happen to think i was looking at your questions think about um excelsior at this point in time so they're just there's they're just unlimited resources you just have to search a little bit but if you call the SCAES office or one of these co-ops offices or you can go to homeschoolhelp.com uh, and get some information there on curriculum and uh, other things just just don't be intimidated by the fact that you might need to search a little bit harder than you did when your kids um, were in a traditional school and you know, maybe the best way to say this is when Joe and I, we lived up north, we were in Philadelphia and Boston for a couple of years. And when we came back, we settled in the same public school district that I had, I had attended because the schools were great. That's where I wanted my kids to go to school. And, uh, and so that, that is the type of research we're used to doing when our kids are in, in institutional school. We find the best school and we locate close by or figure out how to pay the private school tuition. With homeschooling, you've just got to think about different things like, what do I want my kids to learn? Where are they in their educational process? What do they want to do in life? And then you begin to choose resources and books and organizations that help you tailor that education to fit the child. And don't feel like you have to master that overnight. It's a process, just like education in any environment is a process, but it can be very special and meaningful and powerful when it's between a parent and a child. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it, Zan. And um, I know you're really busy and this information has been, um, there has just been a wealth of knowledge. And um, as I mentioned, uh, I, I definitely am going to share all this information on the website. Um, the video will go up on my YouTube channel page, my Facebook page, and my website. And, um, you know, I, I hope this has been a blessing to everyone, answers a lot of questions. And um, until we all meet again, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay well. <laughs>